Спасибо. Я очень рад сегодня быть здесь с вами и представлять с вами очень две одного друга моего, моего профессора Ди Фредди. Мы являлись студентами Туринского университета много лет назад, к сожалению, 40, 40 лет назад. Но Туринский университет был тоже университет. Я профессор Туринского университета, профессор Фредди тоже. И э, аргумент, э, аргумент, о чем он будет сегодня говорить, тему его доклада, это очень-очень интересно. Э, профессор Оди Фредди является очень известной математикой, э, э, его специальность по математике – это логика, но его интересы очень распространены, я могу сказать, он не только математик, он философ, он журналист, он, э, по-моему, э, я э, постараюсь говорить, это современный метрополис Италии. Э, э, поэтому э, его тема, э, его доклад будет абсолютно э, блестящий, а в этом я уверен и рад дам э, ему слово. Ему слово. Okay, спасибо. Я тоже очень рад, но, к сожалению, э, я по-русски говорю. Говорил очень давно, 30 лет назад когда жил в Новосибирске, но э, после этого все забыл. И поэтому э, по-английски э, буду говорить. Извините меня. Uh, today, uh, should I repeat what I said in Russian? Because I'm not sure you know the Russian, no, no, no. right? But <laughs> I just said that they cannot speak Russian, right? So, uh, uh, we'll speak English, but I'm sure you know that uh, all of you uh, know it better than I do. And uh, let me explain, first of all, uh, what I'm, what I'm going to tell you, because uh, it's going to be the appendix of a book, which is the third volume of, uh, of a work, you know, in three volumes. So it's just the very end of, of a long work uh, in which I tried to, to give uh, a history, an illustrated history of geometry, starting from the Egyptians, uh, the Indians, uh, the Chinese, and so on, right, and coming little by little, you know, all the way uh, to the uh, modern times. And this third volume is only about the 1900s, the last century, right? And what I tried to do is to, uh, well, you see, you know, geometry is the study of, uh, of figures, right? Of space, right? So it's very useful uh, on one side, you know, impossible on the other side to illustrate it. And the best way to illustrate geometry, I think, is to do it through art, right? So for, throughout the book, I tried to uh, choose uh, examples from uh, the history of art, of, of all of the world, of course, right? Uh, examples that would actually fit the mathematical content of the book. But in the appendix, you know, I tried to do the opposite. So, and this is what I'm going to show you today, right? I'll try to uh, look at the art, you know, without uh, having the, uh, uh, the need of exhibiting mathematics. But I chose some examples of pictures in which there is a mathematical content even if the painters uh, did not try to, 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 to put it in, right? So sometimes, you know, you go to the, uh, to the museums, you know, I've been uh, two days ago to the Tritakov Gallery, the modern part, right? And you look at the pictures, right? And most of them have nothing to do with mathematics at first sight. If you look closely, right, then you will discover sometimes, and I would say even often, a mathematical content. So that's what I'm trying to explain, to explain, right? There's not going to be much mathematics, of course, right? So some of you would be disappointed, some other probably would be happy, right? And uh, we'll see, right? But in the end, uh, then there will be uh, time for questions and answers, and, uh, and we'll see. The only mathema really mathematical part that I'm going to show you is uh, this picture, right? Uh, because uh, there are four, four possible ways of painting or depicting uh, an image, right? And the image here is just a circle, right? It's a very uh, simplified situation, right? And uh, why do we have four different type, uh, types of uh, depiction? Well, first of all, as you see, 
there is the point of view, right? It depends very much on how far you are from the painting you're making, right? Well, of course, you know, you cannot be too far, otherwise you wouldn't touch it, right? But ideally, right, you could, you could place yourself as a painter very far away from the, from the canvas, right? And uh, the left-hand side shows what happens if you go so far away that you can actually consider yourself put at an infinity, right? At an infinite distance. And when you're so, so uh, far away from the, from the painting, right? Well, then all the rays from, from your eyes are parallel, right? This is exactly what happened with the, with the sun rays, right? The sun is so far away from us, right, that all the rays, you know, come to, to, the, to the earth, you know, in a parallel way, right? So that's the first possibility. And the second possibility instead, you see, you know, there's a point in there, right, and a cone starts in, starting from the point. That means that you're sufficiently uh, uh, close to the painting, to the canvas, right, that you can consider yourself at the finite distance. So the main division is infinite distance or finite distance, right? So those are two possibilities. But then you have an object, right? And you want to project it or you want to depict it on a canvas. And the object, suppose it's a circle, right? So it's a flat object, right? And you also have a flat, uh, flat canvas, right? You have, again, two possibilities because the two canvases could be parallel one to the other, right? Or they could be a blink, right? They could, have, they could make an angle, right? So two possibilities for the distance, infinite or finite. Two possibilities for the canvas and the object, right? Parallel or not parallel, right? So that makes four possibilities, right? And uh, you see, you know, the object that, that we want to depict is always the same one, right? It's the uh, gray circle, right? But there are four different pictures, depending on whether you're far away or close, right? And whether the, the painting is parallel or uh, not parallel, right? Uh, the blue one is what is called a metric geometry. In other words, you know, you project the object onto the canvas, right? And the distances are preserved. So whatever, you know, you take two points, right? And the distance between two points is still the same on the canvas, right? And instead, uh, you, you see, you know, if and this is what happens when the rays are parallel, parallel, right? So when you are yourself at infinity with respect to the camera, okay? That's the first thing. So uh, the metric uh, geometry. Uh, the green one instead is called similarity geometry, right? Because the shape, you see, you know, the, uh, the circle, you know, has a shape, right, which is preserved. But as you see, you know, it's a bigger thing, right? So the distances are, are not preserved, but the shape is still the same, right? So you blow it up, for example, right? Or you shrink it, right? And that's called a uh, similar geometry. The red one instead, it's called affine geometry, right? And uh, you see, this is what happens when you're at infinity, but you're projecting on a canvas which is not parallel to the object, right? And the fourth, the yellow one, the most general one, uh, is called projective geometry. Well, of course, you know, the other three geometries are special cases of projective geometry. So that's the most uh, complicated situation. And as you see, you know, the circles, which in metrical geometry and in similarity geometry are both still circles, right? In affine geometry and uh, in the uh, projective geometry are not circles anymore, but they become ellipses, right? And in more general cases, you know, they could become any conic sections, you know, parabola, hyperbola, and so on, okay? So those are the main geometries that we have to keep in mind because now I'm going to show you examples of uh, paintings that have been done by painters that probably didn't even know what geometry was, right? But anyway, uh, this is the first example. So this is an old example. It's a painting uh, from the Egyptian time, so it's 4,000 years ago, right? And as you see, you know, it's very typical. You recognize it's Egyptian, first of all, you know, because you see the people writing it, and you read uh, probably most of you, right? since you're so brilliant, right? You can read even the, uh, the script, right? But it's very typical because the Egyptians like to paint persons, like, like here, right? In two different ways, right? The upper part of the body, right? As you see here, the chest, right? Was parallel to the, to the wall in this case, right? Or to the canvas, right? And instead, you know, you see the legs, right? They're not parallel. You know, on purpose, you know, they put uh, oblique, right? So those are two different geometries, the upper one uh, and, the, and the lower one. 
And what kind of geometries are they? Where, uh, the Egyptians like to paint in a very abstract way. And the idea is, you know, they put themselves so far away, right, that you could consider them at infinity. So the chest of those figures is an example of metric geometry, right, in which the distances are conserved, right? And instead, the legs is an example of a fine geometry, right? A fine altogether, not that fine, right? Which is also an adjective, of course. You know, it's also fine in this sense, right? But in, uh, that's not what I meant, okay? So now look at this different painting, right? This, this is, as I said, you know, it's 4,000 years ago, right? This is only 150 years ago. And you recognize it, right? It's one of the famous paintings of Gauguin, right? And again, it's exactly the same thing. He paints as if he was uh, an Egyptian, right? And he does exactly the same trick, right? The chests uh, are parallel, right? And the legs are, uh, are oblique, right? And the interesting thing is that this painting here, uh, this is a picture of this painting. And it was found uh, on Gauguin's table when he died in Tahiti, uh, actually, in some of the Marquesas Islands. So uh, he, he was actually doing it on purpose. He was uh, copying Egyptian painting, right, in and transforming, uh, transforming this, this technique into a, a modern way. But from our point of view, they look exactly the same, and they use exactly the same kind of geometry, uh, upper part of the body, metric geometry, and lower part of the body, uh, instead, uh, a fine geometry. Well, of course, uh, one could think, oh, oh, look at this, you know, so now we already understand what's happening. Right? So we will come to projected geometry only at the very end of the story, right? So only the modern uh, could, would know how to, the, to make projected geometry onto canvas, right? And instead, look at this. You know. These are uh, famous grottos, and actually, I know that uh, even in Russia there are examples of these, uh, of these paintings. These, these actually go back to 30 or 40,000 years ago. So before everything started, before people will even knew how to write, right? They were already painting, and as you see, you know, this is a perfect example of a projection in the sense of projected geometry. Right? Uh, the uh, the observer, the uh, the artist, is at a finite distance, and the two the two planes are not parallel. Right? And I've seen in the uh, in the museum of the Red Square, uh, and I have to confess, you know, that I went there because I. Uh, as I said, you know, I spent two years in Novosibirsk uh, in 92, uh, 1982, 1983. Then something something happened, right? Uh, this was not in Russia at the time, right? This was in the Soviet Union. You know that. Uh, well, most of you are too young, you know, to even know that the Soviet Union existed. Right? But that was the Soviet Union, right? It was a very different country, right? So I had a little trouble, you know, with the Soviet Union. You know, then I had to escape, you know. And I was sentenced uh, uh, to uh, a number. Sorry, everybody had. Yes, but not, not, not as big, because uh, I was sentenced uh, in absentia to 14 years, right, of, of prison, right, which I never did, of course, right, because I, were, I, I already escaped to it, right, but then I decided it was better not to come back, right, because uh, otherwise, you know, somebody would ask me, you know, to serve, you know, my term. But 32 years later, you know, I thought, well, you know, it's a different country, right, and so long a time has passed, right, that probably everybody forgot, right? So I came, uh, I came in uh, December, right, with my wife, and I told her, well, you know, you know, in the Red Square, you know, there is the Museum of Revolution. And she told me, I don't want to see it. I said, well, what do you mean, you know, I want to see, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the red uh, brick building, you know, that is there. So she didn't want to see it, and now that I came back, you know, three months later, you know, for the second time after 30 years, uh, yesterday or two days ago, you know, I ran on the, on the uh, Red Square, you know, I bought a ticket, you know, and entered the uh, Revolution Museum, and I discovered it's not a Revolution Museum anymore. It's, uh, it's a history of Russia, right? But it ends here before yeah, yeah. Nicholas II. It has right? never been in Revolution Museum. It's no? never. never. I think our sister with him all the time. He, ah, there they are. It's my memory. Not, it's only, it's not only I forgot my Russian, you know, but I even forgot my geography, right? And now I know where it is. It's a little part. Right? And there is legend, there is legend is here. Tomorrow you bring me there. <laughs> but anyway, but this, this is just to say, you know, that I went to see this museum, and in the first uh, few uh, rooms, right, there are examples of paintings. Right? Very amusing, actually, very interesting, right? Uh, up on the, on the wall. 
So even in Russia, you know, at the time, you know, tens of, uh, of thousands of uh, years ago, right, people were already using projective geometry. But usually, when we paint uh, persons, for example, right, what do we do, right? Well, uh, we are usually flat. Well, some of us are less flat than others. Right? But anyway, <laughs> in general, you know, we perceive ourselves, you know, as flat persons, right? And uh, some of them, I don't right? tell me, but, uh, you know, and we paint ourselves usually right uh, uh, onto canvases which are parallel to us, right? Well, uh, you have to remember, right, that we're not completely flat, right? Because usually most of us have two feet, right? And the two feet actually stick, you know, uh, uh, in the other direction, right? That they're perpendicular, right? So if you paint a person, right, uh, and you paint it on a canvas which is parallel, well, most of the body would be uh, well, either a fine or a metric geometry, depending on how far you put yourself, right? But the feet would be distorted, right? But most of the people do, do not actually look, you know, at the feet on uh, on painting, right? So you don't discover it, right? But what would happen if you did the opposite, and if instead of projecting the body, you know, parallel to the canvas, you projected the feet parallel to the canvas? Then the body would be distorted, right? And look at this. This is exactly what happens, right? This is a famous uh, painting by Mantegna. There's a man there, right, that uh, was killed by somebody, right? I mean, there's a story, you know, I don't know how many of you know this story, because, you know, there has been a situation in between, right? So, uh, memory of this probably got lost. This is called Jesus, for, you know, for, for, for those who don't know, right? And uh, Mantegna, you know, wanted to give you a strange way of looking at Jesus who is laying, you know, on this table, right? And you see the body, you know, completely distorted. Why is this? Well, because, you know, the canvas is practically at 90 degrees with respect to the, uh, to the plane of the feet, right? And so the, the body is completely distorted, but the feet, you know, should, be, uh, should actually uh, be preserved, right? That's a, a famous and an old, if, if you want to, to have the, uh, the true year, is, 1475, so it's more than 500 years ago. But if you want to have a more modern painting, you know, it does exactly the same thing, right? It's almost the same person, right? <laughs> People actually like to look at the Jesus' feet, right? Uh, and as you see, you know, this is Salvador Dali. And the interesting thing is that Dali is a surrealist painter. So one wouldn't expect that Dali has anything to do with mathematics, whereas instead he has a, he had a, a great interest in mathematics. He knew mathematicians and he got uh, suggestions from them to do some of the paintings. And look at this. You know, this is the guy because uh, the same guy here, you know, looked dead. But this was a trick, you know. Then uh, eventually, you know, he resurrected, right? And then after resurrection, you know, he ascended to heaven. I don't know if you know the story, but anyway, just. And so what happens if you stay on the earth, right? Then you look at this guy, you know, and he's ascending. It's like Gagarin, right? Today we've been to the, uh, <laughs> to the place that, uh, where were we this morning? The Academy of Science. The Academy of Science. You know, and I have seen, you know, the statue of Gagarin, you know, uh, ascending uh, to, uh, to heaven. It's the same thing, right? If you want to picture Gagarin from below, right? Then the feet will be arrived, right? But then, of course, you know, the body will be, will be distorted, right? So that's a nice example of using geometry, right, in a very inventive way, right? But the, the geometries are always the same, right? It's always a fine or, uh, or metric uh, geometry because the canvas is parallel to a part of the body, right? Now look at this name. This is an interesting name because uh, it's, a, it's a Japanese whose name I can never pronounce, right? It's a Shigeo Fukuda, you know, any Japanese in here? Ah, is it, uh, did I do it correctly? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Because <laughs> if there was no Japanese, I would have asked, right? But if there is one, you have to ask. Now, the interesting thing is that this Bukuda, you know, the work of art is the part on the right. So you enter the room, right? And you enter uh, from that side there, right? So you see a, a, a piano forte, or forte piano, whatever you call it, right? Uh, a piano, right? Which is completely broken, you know, all pieces, you know, are, uh, scattered in space. But then you turn and you look in the in the mirror, which just reflects those uh, those parts, right? And miraculously, right, uh, all the parts come together, right, and they recombine into a true piano or, or piano forte, right? 
So that's a very interesting thing. And here, you know, you cannot just do it by chance, right? So uh, this is really, you know, a, a way of using geometry in an inverted way. That is, you have to distort uh, an object, in this case it's a piano, but the Buddha does uh, all sorts of things, right? Sometimes you enter a room, right, and you see just a, a, a heap of forks and knives, for example, right? And then a light comes in, right, and the shade actually projects a motorcycle, for example. So you really have to know geometry to understand, you know, what will happen to all those pieces when you look at them from a particular point of view and they recombine together, right? into uh, this very inventive, uh, inventive way. Now that's something, uh, th this idea of looking at things from a particular point of view, it's something that always existed in art, right? But especially in the uh, 15, 1600s, when people discovered what is called uh, the, the dark room, that you probably know because of photography, right? Now, in English, the, uh, the, the object you use to, uh, to take pictures of, it's called camera, right? Now, uh, I don't know if you ever asked yourself, why is it called camera? Uh, and we do it in Italian, you know, because camera in Italian is a word for room, right? So what has this to do with, uh, with, the, with the camera, the photographic camera? Well, the idea is very simple. Actually, uh, I don't know if you ever asked yourself, how does a camera work? And it's a very simple thing, and actually the camera doesn't need anything except for a dark room, which of course in the camera is very small, right? But it's still dark, right? And, uh, and then a little hole. That's the only thing you need. You would say, well, you need lenses and uh, of course, you know, a, a roll of film. No, nothing like that. You know. The camera works if you have an empty room, right? Dark room with a small hole in uh, one of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the walls. Why is that? Well, this is nature, you know. Nature does this, right? And you see, there is a building on the right, right? And uh, there are optical rays that connect uh, the buildings, the, all, all parts of the building. Oh, maybe I can use this. Is this a, a, a laser, some laser thing? Or, or no, this is just a TV thing. It's probably better if I look at show, right? Uh, we, should, we shouldn't use this. But anyway, uh, you, you look at the parts of the, of the building on the right, right? And you connect them with a ray, right, that goes through the, uh, the, the little hole, right? And the rays will actually go through the hole, right, and continue until they hit the next wall, right? And there will be magically or miraculously an image formed on the wall the only thing is, as you might imagine, right, that if you if you project the top of the church, right, through the hole, well, then the top goes down at the bottom, right? So the picture is inverted on the wall, right, but it comes out naturally. There's nothing you have to do, right? So uh, painters discovered this thing probably by chance, right? Probably there was a wall uh, with a little hole. Uh, of course, you know, if the hole is too big, you know, then nothing happens, you know, because the way he actually, you know, distort, right? But if the, the hole is very small, right, and probably by chance sometimes you know, it could happen, you know, somebody entered into a dark room you know, and saw a picture there uh, upside down. And then uh, painters started to use this trick. So in the 1500s and the 1600s, you know, this is physics, mathematics, and art all put together. They tried to use it. This is, these are uh, four paintings that uh, a famous uh, Italian painter named Canaletto, a painter from Venice, did, right? And uh, if you go to Venice, right, you can ask your school, you know, to take you there, you know, as a holiday, right? And I'll meet you there, right? And I'll bring you to the, uh, take you to the uh, museum, right? And you see the small camera that Canaletto was actually using, right? And it's a camera, a wooden camera, not, uh, not very big, you know, just like this, you know. And he would actually uh, draw exactly what he saw inside the camera, right? And those are four examples of, uh, of what, uh, what, what you could do. Why do we use lenses in, uh, in the real cameras, in uh, photographical cameras? Well, the first lens is put because um, in, in there, uh, well, of course, you know, this is just a, a drawing, right? But the trouble is that the image is not very well on focus, right? Because, you know, those are optical rays, there are all sorts of interferences, right? But if you use a, a lens, a specific lens, right, then you can actually put on focus the image, so you see it better. So that's the use of the first lens. And then, if you don't want to put yourself, you know, upside down, right, 
or uh, if you don't want to paint you know, upside down, then you want to reverse the image. So you need a second lens that would actually flip the image right and put it upside down. So the two lenses are just to put things on focus and to turn the image upside down. But that's the only use the, uh, of the lenses. Everything else is done automatically, right? Then if you have a, a film, of course, you know, the film would impress itself, right, with the image, and painting, uh, photography would, uh, would come out. Now, the interesting thing is that many painters, before lenses, before uh, films and everything, use the principle of the uh, dark room, right, and of the photographic painting. And uh, this is one of the uh, most famous painters who actually did it, and we have witnesses about this. It's called Caravaggio. You uh, recognize him, you know, because it's all black, right? When you see a painting, you know, uh, painted in black, you know, as the Rolling Stone would, would, would sing, you know. <laughs> I see a door, right? And I see it painted black. Well, uh, it's Caravaggio, right? In that case, not Big Jagger. Who, incidentally, I don't know if you know the Rolling Stone, probably you do, you know, by name, right? Mick Jagger is, a, is an interesting guy that you could actually invite here because he started at the... Ah, you'd like that, but he's 70 <laughs> years old, right? So, <laughs> but anyway, he started at the London School of Economics. Uh, no, not many people know this, right? And he has an interest in mathematics and uh, in particular in cryptography. And he, for example, bought uh, one of the uh, German Enigma machines. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, you know, the machines that the Germans used to, to uh, encrypt their messages, right? And a few years ago, there was a movie, right, which was, was called Enigma, right? And the movie was produced by Mick Jagger. So hopefully, you know, now that I gave you the idea, right, you invite Mick Jagger and you invite me too, right, and, I, and I'll interview him on uh, this subject. But anyway, let's go back, you know, to uh, the, the painted black, right? Uh, David Caravaggio. Look at, the, look at the light here. This is exactly, you know, the trick of Caravaggio. It's always, uh, he's always painting things, you know, in dark, in the dark, right? And always trying to use the light that comes from a specific point of view, right? In this case, is the, is the, the window on the right, right? This is called, uh, it's called the call of Emmaus, right? This is, there's somebody there, you know, uh, that says, you come, right? And the answer is, who me, right? Well, but this is the story, right? Uh, and it, it, it's not of, of interest to us, right? The, the interesting thing for us is that the, the, the light comes from, uh, from the right, right? And this is another example of Caravaggio. This is the so-called Madonna of Loreto, right? Caravaggio used to, to play other tricks. For example, this Madonna is a prostitute, right? But I mean, you shouldn't say it, right? But the model, right, that he used, you know, for the Madonna, you know, was a real prostitute in life, right? And he used to do, you know, all those tricks, you know, to the church that was actually paying the painting, right? But anyway, look at the, the light in, in this case. It's light that comes from above, right? From, from a hole in, in the roof, right? And that uh, uh, enlightens the, uh, the, the, the figure of the mama and the, uh, and the child, right? In a very specific way with clouds and everything, right? Now, since we're talking about Caravaggio, let's see a couple of other painters by, by him, right? This is a self-portrait. Now, what is, what is mathematical? Uh, in this self-portrait. Well, you would say nothing, right? Really, because you know, it's like a painting, it's like a picture, right? Ah, you know, this is Caravaggio painting himself. How can a painter paint himself, right? Well, you, you did some trick, right? And the trick that they were using at the time was a mirror. And you say, oh, big trick. Ah, but the mirror is, you know, the whole theory of reflection comes into this, right? So the optics, right, from Euclid to Descartes and so on, right, you have to know the laws of optics to be able to paint yourself, you know, into, uh, uh, into a mirror. This, uh, I mean, the girls, you know, should close their eyes, right, and uh, this is still Caravaggio, and you see on the right, this is still a self-portrait, right, but not, not of the most overly, of the most, I don't know, uh, important parts of his body, right, but the, the interesting thing in here, you know, is connected to what I said at the very beginning, because as you see, this is still done using a mirror. But this time, the mirror is not like, like this one, right? So it's in front of you, right? And so you're doing it parallel to, to, to your body, right? But instead, the mirror is below you, right? You step on the mirror, right? And it's exactly the same kind of painting that Dali or Mantegna would do, you know, with Christ ascending to, to heaven, right? And uh, let's take this out, you know, because then otherwise, you know, I'm accused uh, another time, you know, and another 14 years, you know, uh, of, uh, of non-J, but anyway, 
That's a very famous painting. It's called Las Meninas of Velázquez. Most of you would know it, right? What is, uh, what is interesting from a mathematical point of view here? Well, first of all, the interesting thing is that, well, it's called Las Meninas, right? Which means the little girls, right? And uh, you see the little girls in front, right? So there is this princess in there, right? And this is before the revolution, right? So there was still princess in, uh, in Spain, right? And then there, there are servants in there, you know, also uh, very small, but not, but not very young, as you can see, right? On the, the doors, right, on the, on the right. But the interesting thing is that the painter is there. You see it on the left, right? That's Velasquez. So Velasquez is in the painting, right? Which is called as Menides. It's very strange, right? Because you would say, well, if he's painting the girls which we see in front of us, right? It should be where we are, right? Because that's the trick of the, of the art, you know, classical art, right? You put yourself in the same place as the painter was, you know, when he painted the canvas, right? And then you see exactly what he saw, right? But in here, it cannot be this case because the painter is there, right? It's on the left, uh, in the painting itself. So you ask yourself, yourself well, I mean, what is he painting? This is not the real painting, because you see, the real painting is there, you know, very big canvas, right? And he's painting something on the painting, but this is not what you see there, right? They're just bothering, you know, the, the girls, you know, in front of, you know, the painting. So what do we know about what he, what he was painting? Well, look, there's another mirror in there. Well, first of all, Velasquez needed one mirror to paint himself. Right? So he used it for the, painter, uh, for, the, for the painting on the left. But then there's a mirror inside the painting itself, right? And in the mirror, you see, aha, you should see yourself, right? Because you're in front, right? And instead, you see two people. And they are the king and the, and the queen. So now we understand, aha, he put a mirror in there to let us know that he's actually painting not the girls, but he's painting the father and mother, right? The king and the queen, right? And we know it because they're reflected in the mirror that he put it in, uh, in the picture itself. So those are interesting tricks, right? Because, you know, this is a, a very wise use uh, of, uh, of tools that by themselves are very simple, right? What is simpler than a mirror, right? But if you use them like this, you know, they become more sophisticated, right? And of course, one of the ideas would be, well, now you understand, you know, because you're not, you're looking at the, uh, at the painting, right? And you're not uh, in the place of the painter itself, which is there, but you're in the place of the king and the queen, so you feel much better, right? Because we are. But he's looking at us, right? And he's painting us, actually, you know. So it's a reverse uh, perspective, in a certain sense. Since we're talking about Velázquez, here is another Velázquez. Now the boys close their, uh, <laughs> close their eyes, right? And uh, this, is the, uh, this is Venus in front of the mirror. That's one example, because at the time, you know, most of the painters would like to, to paint Venus for, for obvious reasons, right? But, but also for mathematical reasons, not only the reasons you think uh, in this moment, right, with your dirty mind, right? And uh, why did they like so much to paint Venus at the mirror? Well, look at the painting. And don't look, you know, at what you're looking, right? <laughs> but look at the mirror itself, right? And you see Venus in the mirror. And the interesting thing is that Venus is looking at you. So she is not looking at herself in the mirror. It's a very strange thing, right? She's, uh, she's laying on the, on the sofa or on the bed, right? And instead of uh, uh, having a mirror in front of herself and looking at herself, right, as Venus should do, she's looking at us. And that's a, a very wise use, as I said before, you know, of the laws of, uh, of optics, right? Because, you know, it's a trick, right? And it's a trick that, for example, is used very much in movies. Because when you see an actor or an actress in a movie, right, and you see the, uh, the director is actually showing, you know, the actor or the actress that are uh, looking at themselves in the mirror. If they actually did it, right, you wouldn't see them in the eye, right? But of course, you know, so when, the, when uh, well, some of you perhaps are actors, right, <laughs> and you already did it, you know, on the, on the scene, right? So if, you, if the director would tell you, don't look at yourself, you know, but look at me, you know, in the eye, you know, in the mirror, right? And it would be, you know, a, a directed uh, sign. So that's very interesting. So you see, you know, that sometimes, you know, what you see at first sight 
it's not really what the painter wanted to, uh, to, show, to show, right? And that's why the painters at the time, as I said, you know, liked so much this idea, you know, Venus in the, uh, in the mirror. But now look at this painting. Oh, this is an interesting painting. This is more close to us. Is, uh, that's a, uh, an impressionist. This is Manet, right? It's called Le Bar of the Folie Bergère, right? We're in France at the end of the 1800s, right? And of course, you know, this poor guy, right, this painter, right, of course, he didn't know any of the rules that we just said, right? Because here we are, you know, on the bar, right? There's a table, right? And you see, you know, champagne bottles on the, uh, on the left, right? And there are oranges. There is this girl, right? She's supposed to be the, uh, the waitress, right? She's looking at us in the eye, right? And that's a very interesting thing, because if she's looking at us in the eye, and then she's reflecting in the mirror behind her, right? We shouldn't see her reflection, right? Because we're in front of her, right? And the reflection is behind, right? So she's covering the, the reflection. So why did, did he put it on the right? Well, probably because he wanted us to, to show us also the back, right? But it's, I mean, you cannot do it. You said, okay, I'll put it on the right. Who cares? And then, who are you? Well, of course, you know, you're the right, the person on the right, right? So you're the guy who actually goes to the bar, right, and orders uh, you know, a drink, right? And this is even worse, right, because you should be again, you know, in front of the waitress, right? And, and then instead, you know, he wanted us to, uh, to show also uh, ourselves or, uh, or uh, the guy who's asking for the, for the drink, right, and the back of the girl. But this is not very convincing, because look at the champagne bottle. Champagne bottles have absolutely no obstacle, right? So they should be reflected in the mirror. But if you look in the mirror, there's no champagne bottle. Not at all. There are two or three other bottles in there, you see. But they're not, they, they don't even look like the champagne bottles. So uh, this was done in the, uh, when was it exactly? Uh, uh, 1882, right? So for a century, people thought, well, there's an impressionist, right? I mean, so the whole idea of impressionist uh, if impressionism is don't follow the rules, right? Who cares? But um, I mean, it's not very convincing. You know, this is not any impressionist. This is Manet, you know, one of the great uh, painters of the of that era, right? Of that period. Is it possible that he made all those mistakes, you know, inadvertently? And it's not convincing. So, 15 years ago, uh, in the United States, somebody, a professor of, of art, asked a student, you know, and said, "Well, no." You know, you want to have a degree, take this painting and explain it to me, right? And the guy thought about it a little bit, right? And he got the explanation. So now look, this is what happens. That's very interesting. The girl is looking at you, right? So somehow, you know, she has to be directed toward the painter, right? This guy is looking again, you know, at us, right? So again, he has to, to turn, you know, toward the painter. But not necessarily the same way. So that's the explanation of the painting. In other words, uh, I'm sorry, you know, this is in Italian, but I mean, I'll explain it, right? And, and we can actually understand, right? The punto di vista is just, you know, the point of view, right? So this is where the painter is, right? So Manet was there, you know, or at least, you know, he imagined himself you know, to be on the right, right? So he's not in front of the girl, right? And not even in front of the mirror. He's very on the side, right? And the girl has to look at the painter in the eye, right? So she has to turn, right, and face the painter, okay? Now, also the guy, right, has to look at the, uh, at the painter. And how can he look at the, the, at the painter in the eye? Well, he can certainly turn, right, and he will be outside the painting, right? You see, it's not painted because this is the cone of vision, right? So the only thing that you see in the picture is what is inside that triangle, right, this cone of view, right? So the guy turns on the opposite direction as the girl, right? So they're parallel, but one faces the painter, and the guy turns instead with the back of the painter and looks in the mirror. He's, this is again exactly the same trick that we did, we saw in here, right? In uh, the Venus uh, at the mirror, right? And now look at the at the genius of Manet. You see. The, the triangle, you know, uh, actually borders the champagne glasses, that sh the champagne bottles, right? Which is the group in there, you know, those six uh, little circles, right? 
But as you see, you know, the champagne bottles are reflected in the mirror. But the image of the champagne bottles is, uh, is covered by the lady itself, right? So the painter doesn't see them. And what does he see? Well, he sees the reflection of bottles that are on the table, but outside the, the, uh, the cone of vision, right? So he put, and notice, notice how he had to put the, 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 the bottles, you see there, right? The bottles like an S, like that, right? In such a way that when they are reflected, and then when they're seen from, from, uh, uh, from the right, right? And not directly from, uh, from, from above, right? Well, they would look exactly as they are. Now you look at the picture again, ah, and now you understand it. So there's nothing strange, right? It seems to us that the girl is facing us, but simply because she turned toward us, right? And so she looks parallel at the painting, right? And then the reflection is there because you see, uh, it, it, you see both the girl and the reflection in the triangle, right? And if you look at the uh, at the glass, uh, sorry, at the uh, at the bottles in there, well, you don't see the reflection of the champagne bottles because it, they're behind the girl and she's coloring their reflection. Right? But you see the reflection of other bottles that are outside the point of view, right? And they're distributed in such a way that you actually see them put together. So this is a very interesting use, I think, of uh, mathematics in a reading uh, of a painting, right? Well, there's another famous painting, which seems to be, again, you know, uh, an example of a mistake. Here, you know, this is a uh, Vermeer, and you see, you know, that I, I forgot the, the, the year, of course, you know, 1662, right? You see this girl that is playing on, on a version uh, of a pianoforte, the virginal is called, right? A sort of a clavier, right? And look at what happens in the mirror. Well, first of all, the mirror is almost uh, on the wall, right? It's a, it's a little detached from the, world, from the wall, but not too much, right? So it should be impossible for us to see the girl in the mirror at all. Because if the mirror is parallel to the girl, right, well, it would reflect what's, what's in front of the mirror, right? And the girl is not in front of the mirror, it's below, right? So there shouldn't be anything in the mirror. Well, of course, you know, the mirror is a little inclined, right? But that's not enough to show us the girl. But secondly, look at the girl. The girl, the, the reflection of the girl is actually looking at the guy in there, right? The piano teacher. But if you look at the girl downstairs, right? Well, she's looking in front of her. So uh, this is something that uh, has not been solved yet, right? So this is possible. You, you know, if you want to make a thesis on that, right? Try to explain whether this is a specific point of view with some trick like the one we saw before for Manet, right? Or whether this is just, you know, freedom that uh, Vermeer took, right? And because you wanted to do it, you know, uh, or, or perhaps because this is what happens often, right? Painters would actually paint and then paint again, you know, on top of what they already did, right? So maybe they just covered, you know, half of the painting, right? And they left the other half. And then, of course, you know, simply because they forgot or whatever, right? So this is an open problem. I don't have the solution for that, right? But if I look at this, this is a picture. Or is it? Have you ever seen a picture like this? That is, you take a picture, you know, of a bowl, right? Of a spheric bowl. And you see it, you know, like a, like, like a rugby ball, right? Like a, a, an oval thing, right? And look at this. Ah. This is the real picture, right? That's what you see, actually. You look at the sphere, right? And you see it's spherical, right? And then you distort this picture, right? In such a way you know, as to make the sphere, you know, to become oblong, right? But the interesting thing is that this is the real picture. And this is the trick, namely, uh, with Photoshop, you know, you take the real picture and you distort it in such a way that you make it appear uh, as, as if it was a real sphere, because the eye distorts when you, when you look at, at a thing, you know, from from from, a, from a, a close distance, then the eye distort distorts the picture, right? But the brain knows that the eyes is distorted in the picture, and so it puts it back again. There's something you can do easily, right? Put put two. You usually have two hands, right? 
hopefully you don't, I'm not making a cough, right? But anyway, you don't hope, right? You know, so take the two hands, right? And put one hand uh, close to your nose, right? And one hand, you know, uh, a little further, right? I see that two or three people are doing it, right? <laughs> Most of the other one should do it, right? Well, if you look at that, you know, without paying attention, you don't notice any difference, right? But if you pay attention, right, and you look at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the hand which is close by, right, then you see it very big, right? And if you look at the other one, you see it very small. The two hands are completely different in your sight. But if you don't pay attention, the, 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 uh, the brain compensates, right? And it makes you forget the fact, you know, that you see a big, big hand, you know, and a small hand. Also because you know, you know your hands, right? You use them a lot, right? So you know that they're equal, right? So even if you move them, you know, it doesn't matter what you see, right? You know, no, you shouldn't do it like this. That doesn't work. You should do it like this. <laughs> okay? So that's interesting. What is this? Well, this is a paradox of vision. It's a paradox that painters know very well. Namely, that if you paint things exactly as the eyes uh, see them, well, then uh, when somebody sees the painting, you know, what they say, they would say that's something strange, right? Because they would see uh, a distorted picture like this, right? And they, and, and they would say, oh, you're not able to paint right, right? So what the painters do, they paint wrong so that you think that the painting is right. So that's a little converse, you know, a little perverse, right? And that's a very uh, typical example. Uh, this is Raphael. You go to the Vatican, right, in the, uh, the, in the Raphael's uh, rooms, right? This is called the School of Athens. It's a very big painting, right? Another big example of, uh, of a central perspective, right? It's, it's a painting, uh, it's, it's a half moon, right? And all the lines conver converge into a point, you know, which is in the center of the painting. There's Plato and Aristotle, and then there are all sorts of scientists around. No economists, because at the time you know, there was no economist. <laughs> but but on, on, a, on, a, on a corner, right, there are those two guys, right? One is Ptolemy, right? Ptolemaeus, the, uh, the famous astronomer of the, of the ancient times. And in front of him, uh, there's Zoroastros. This tells you, you know, how confused they were, you know, in the 1500s. What, what has to do with Zoroastros, Zoroastros with Ptolemaeus, right? But anyway, but the interesting thing for us is that th those two guys had in their hands, one has, Ptolemaeus has the, uh, the, the earth, right? The globe of the earth. And the other one has another globe, which is the fixed star, right? And how, how do you see the globes? They're perfect cir circles. And so, so that's a mistake, right? Because if they're globes, right, wherever you see them, right, well, they become ovoid, right? Uh, uh, ellipsoid, as uh, a physicist would say, right? But Raphael knew about this uh, paradox of perception, and so he did it exactly, you know, as, uh, as circles. So this means, from the point of view of the beginning of this talk, that to, there's only one way that you can see a sphere exactly as a sphere, if you put yourself very far away to infinity, right? And so, the whole painting of Raphael is a, a painting, you know, where the, there's a perspective, right? So it's a, fin a finite distance from the painting. But for those two circles, you know, he put himself very back, you know, uh, from, from the painting, right? So he put himself at infinity. So we discovered that sometimes, you see a painting, a painting, and in that painting there could be different points of view, because the painter could decide, you know, that for some, you know to correct things that he didn't like, right? And he would move while while painting, and in the end it would give you just one picture, right? Which would be completely distorted, right? Now, you remember the guy, you know, who was lying there, Jesus Christ, you know, Mantegna, right? with the feet in front of us, right, and uh, the body you know, of Rome. Now, was that painting done correctly, or was it distorted by Mantegna? This is 1500, right? So there's, there's an easy way to do it, right? If you have a friend, right, you, know, you, you, or you kill him, or, or at least you, know, you ask him you know, to pretend to be, to be there, right? You put it on, on the table, right, and you take a picture of it, right? And the picture doesn't lie, of course, you know, what you, what, what you actually shoot, right, is what, what the eye sees. Well, that's what happens. It's completely different from the, uh, from the painting of Mantegna. You see feet, you know, which are this big, you know, 
they look like Peter the Great's uh, feet, right? <laughs> As you see from, from the boots, right? You know, this giant man, you know, with feet so long. And then, you know, you see, the, you know, the, the, the head, you know, very small, you know, down there, you know, it's completely distorted. It would be very bad, you know, to paint a Christ like this. So, uh, people took Mantegna's painting, right? And they, they put it on, on the computer, right? And they reversed the perspective and asked the computer, how far was the painter, you know, from the, from the canvas when he painted Mantegna's Christ? And the computer didn't know what to do, right? Because you know, I don't understand, I don't understand. So people thought, aha, okay, let's just look at the feet, right? And cover the rest. And then the computer says, okay, this is two meters, right? So Mantegna was around two meters from the feet of Christ, right? But then you cover the feet, right? And then you just ask, you know, how far was when he was painting the, the legs, right? And then the computer says, oh, it's 10 meters. And then you look at the, at the face only, right? And the computer says it's 25 meters. So the interesting thing is that in the single painting, there were different perspectives, and the painter was actually going farther and farther from the canvas, right? While depicting things that were farther and farther from uh, from the observer, right? So that in the end, you know, he put together things that had different points of view, all all in the same canvas, much before cubists, for example, that did this uh, normally, right? But they they did it, you know, a hundred years ago. Instead. 500 years ago, he knew what to do in there, right? And sometimes, you know, with perspective, you can do all sorts of strange things. And I'll show you one. This, for example, you know, is a wonderful painting, you know, uh, by uh, an American painter. It's called Howard Hughes. And as you see, right, there are, uh, this is Venice, right? There are channels in Venice. And it's perfectly normal, right? You all know the laws of perspective. Uh, the laws in particular tell you that if you have parallel lines, they converge into a point, which is called point at infinity, right? And you see there, you know, there are two points of infinity because there are two, two channels that are not parallel, right? So you have two. And the interesting thing is that if you go to, to a museum, exactly like with the, uh, what's his name? Fukuda? Right. Da. Ah. <laughs> exactly when uh, uh, you go to see Fukuda's uh, work, right? You have to enter the room from the right point of view, otherwise, you know, all the surprise uh, is spoiled, right? Here, you have to enter the room, you know, in front of the painting. You look at the painting, you see this per perspective, and then you say, okay, nothing bad, right? Then you move. And I have one of, the, of these, you know, you can actually buy copies, right? Uh, I have one of these at home, you know, and I usually, you know, look at it people, you know, that come to my place, you know, because as soon as you move, right, also the building moves, right, and you say, oh, what, what's happening, you know, this is a, an animated painting, right, and you move, you know, you see that the, 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 uh, the house in the middle, right, actually follows you right, like this. Then you want to understand it, so how did you do it? So you go forward, right, and look at this, this is the structure of the painting. I don't know if it's, you know, it's not easy to find it, to, to do it on the, on the cover, but I'll explain, right. You see, it's like a pyramid coming out, right? So uh, the painting is not flat. If you put yourself, you know, uh, along the, the, uh, the wall, you actually see two things coming out of the painting, right? There are two pyramids actually truncated at the, uh, at the very top, right? And then what he does, he inverts the perspective. You see, uh, this is a pyramid coming out. So the thing that is closer to you that, that are looking is uh, uh, this uh, white square and also the other one, right? Those two squares are the, 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 the closest things to you. And the things that are farther are, well, of course, you know, the borders in there and the border in between, right? Because the pyramid goes like, go like this, right? But, uh, sorry, uh, you see, he painted conversely. In, in other words, you know, the two things that are closer to you are the things that look to you as if they were the most distant. So it's completely reversed, right? It's very, uh, very strange, right? but very effective, right? And of course, again, you know, here you have to know exactly the laws of perspective, because then you have to turn them upside down and to do exactly the opposite of what you should do, right? Uh, and then, you know, you would succeed. But of course, you know, it's almost silly to come here to Russia, right, and tell you about the reverse perspective. Because if you go to the Tritiakov uh, gallery, but the ancient one, not the, uh, the modern one, right, 
Then you'll see all the icons, for example, and is there mathematics in the icons one would say? Well, of course not, right? Because the, if you look at the paintings, you know, they're all flat, right? There's no perspective in anything, right? Ah, but if you look at the Holy Trinity, for example, uh, Andre Rubliot, right? Well, you'll see that uh, a very strange painting, right? Look at this. You have three angels in there, right? Uh, that represent the portion you know, of the Trinity. And then, well, what is mathematically there? Nothing, because they're sitting on the table, right? But the interesting thing is, that look, look at the bottom, right? And the, the, the table is, is like this, well, not really, you know, because it's on a rectangle, right? And if Rublyov knew how to paint, right? Well, I'm sorry, don't, uh, don't throw me things, right? But if he knew how to paint, using perspective, right? Since uh, uh, the table is on a rectangle, right, <coughs> the, two, the two lines should converge, right? And instead, as you see, they diverge. They go in the opposite direction. Namely, he inverted again you know, the rules of perspective. Instead of making the parallel lines to converge in a point, he makes them diverge, and the convergent point is outside the painting, not on the painting. And that's what happens. This, these are the rules of, pers of, uh, of perspective. You see, there, there is a, a, a cube in there, right? The yellow paint. If you put yourself in the usual situation, you're in there, right? You're in, uh, in the uh, vanishing point on the right, right? And you project the cube on the canvas, which is there. You project it, and it becomes the red image, right? And if you look from the vanishing point, or from the viewpoint, right? Well, you see that the lines, you know, when they're parallel, converge, right? Where do they converge? Well, they converge into a point which is on the canvas in here, right? But what happens if instead you, you leave the, uh, you forget about the yellow cube, right? And you just take the uh, red projection and you come this side of the painting. In other words, you see the painting from the back. Since when you look it from the right side, from, 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 from the side you're supposed to look at it, the parallel line converge. When you go from the back, well, the parallel line, you, they continue to converge if you were on the other side. But they now they diverge for somebody who looks from the back, right? And that's exactly what Rubriot does. And this is used by all the, by the, the Byzantine uh, painters. It's called the Byzantine perspective. Right? It's, a, it's a strange reverse pers uh, perspective that, uh, that gives you a completely different view. What is the idea in here, the metaphysics? Well, the idea is exactly like in the Meninas, right? where the painter wanted us to, to be in the place of the king and the queen. Right? Well, here, he wants us to, to be right? on, on the point of view, of, 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 on, on the converging point of view, on the point of infinity. And that should give you the idea that you are also part of the painting. Somebody is looking at you. There's somebody behind the painting that is looking at you, right? And you're part of what, what you see on the painting. In other words, you know, this is the view of God as opposed to the view of the painter, right? And that's exactly why they use it in the religious painting. Now, I see on my watch that it's for uh, 5.45, right? Uh, you told me that I should uh, talk for an hour, you know, and I can stop. Uh,